Let's pray together, please. Father, we ask your blessings on Courtney and her family, and we ask for the stabilizing of the condition that's being dealt with. And we want, Father, that we continue to address you knowing the power that you have and knowing the things that you're able to do. We pray earnestly for a person, but more than that, a sister. And we ask with the depth of our hearts that her health can be brought to a stabilization that allows her to function in her family and in your church. For through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. If I talked long, I'd have to tell you things that I'd be guessing on. I do know that she has a heart condition. I'm certain that's what we saw part of, but I don't know a lot about it. Uh, doesn't take long to go over my head with those types of discussions, and so we'll continue to pray and pray earnestly. That's not the first time. It's not the second time. I don't even know where the number would be. You know, uh, we've discussed that for the first time we've taken responsibility to be the overseeing congregation on Doug's support. And if you're the first time, you're kind of groping and you think, well, boy, you've been around preaching long enough, you have it all down pat. Well, you're absolutely incorrect. Uh, I never was on the part of seeing that they got their money at the right time. But I have been on the part of knowing how badly you want your money on time. <laughs> <laughs> and I, all of those that have said that they want to be a part of Josh and Doug, and actually we did Nathan out of the treasury. But we didn't think being new with a building payment and things that we're trying to get around here that we could run Josh and Doug through the treasury. So we said anybody that would like to commit extra to what they normally give, that they do so well. The point being that our bills have not stabilized as a congregation, so we don't feel comfortable adding to those bills at this point in time. So you, and bigger than you, the church bigger than you, have said we want to participate to this level. Well, the task to us is, is to know what we're getting. Uh, maybe this will get to the point where it's a lot simpler, but at this period of time, we're trying to take up monies, the monies early enough to get it to them by the target. Well, Josh target is August 1. That says because it doesn't go to Josh, the sponsoring congregation is Idaloo, that we got to get ours together and get it to Idaloo so Idaloo can get it to him. So the monies that you wanted to go to Josh Clearman need to be in, we'll say the 10th of the month, but we probably can live till the 15th. 
but depending on trying to make it convenient to a Sunday, but get it in and let today be the last day that we're going to mail the check to Idaloo, then Idaloo to Josh, and we're still pressing the U.S. Postal Service uh, this time, so uh, do, do the best that you can, and then make a mental note in your book here, computer, that Doug's needs to, to be in by the end of the month, and the reason that, that we'll be shorter, get, he wants his check on the 15th, and, but we don't have an idolue in the middle. We're going straight to him. So we don't need as long to do that. Um, I don't know if, if that'll need to be said again. I, I hope I'm clear. If, if you just ask me, I'll go back through it again. But I don't, I don't like using this time for that. But I don't, know, I don't know any way to handle what we're trying to get done. So every, everyone that made a commitment that made a commitment to Josh Clearman, today's the day to get your check in, and we'll see that, we'll do what we can to see that it gets there. We're grateful that you're here. God loves you, we love you, and we have an opportunity to just be still a little while and study. I wonder if we have a favorite verse in the Bible. Frankly, I know Mike just read his. Um, and after you got your favorite verse, do you know the longest verse in the Bible? Hmm. It's Esther 8-9. It's a long verse. Do you know the shortest verse in the Bible? A bunch more of us got this. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. I want to talk to us a few minutes about the saddest verse in the Bible, and I'm not sure it's the saddest with all of us. Might not, but it ranks up there really close. And I'm in the book of Acts, and I'm in the 26th chapter, and I'm at the 28th verse. And basically, we'll read more of it later, but what it says is, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. To me, that's the saddest verse I'm going to find. And I look at that and see what he said, and I just broke it down into the three words that seem most germane to the verse. And the first one is almost. You know, I read a story once. History fascinates me, and I read a story or a documentary on the presidential election of 1876. Now think of the stakes. Presidential election of 1876. Samuel J. Tilden was a Democrat from New York. And he had a hundred at the count 184 electoral votes. He was running against Rutherford B. Hayes, a Republican from Ohio, Delaware, Ohio. He had 165 electoral votes. But there were 20 electoral votes that had not been reported because they hadn't completed the count. Rutherford B. Hayes ended up getting all 20 of those electoral votes. Rutherford B. Hayes won the election 185 to 184. Almost. Almost. I don't know the programs that he was running on. I don't know the platform he was talking about. I only know that Tilden almost got to exercise, put in place those programs, and yet that didn't happen. 
almost, and when I look at almost, I think of almost as got to be one of the devil's favorite words. Is there a chance that there's anyone here that's almost converted? Almost persuaded? That's what it said. It said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He was almost. Now, the Bible doesn't record it. If he ever got another opportunity and took advantage of the persuasion that he had, the Bible doesn't record it. I'm thinking that it didn't happen. He was almost persuaded, but he was never altogether persuaded. And I see what God is saying and what we're looking about. Think of the people that have been almost converted. Matthew 18, 3 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of God. I, I won't get... I won't get to be a part of God's kingdom if I'm not altogether converted. Well, then I think in getting maybe closer to you and me, is it, could it be said of me that I'm just almost committed? I have been converted, but maybe I haven't really, really allowed myself to be committed. Maybe I'm only almost committed. And then the scripture that Mike read to us and said, Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will lose his life shall save it, and whosoever will save his life for my sake will save it. And I, 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 for what shall a man be profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? God is telling me that the most important thing in my life is my relationship with Him. There's nothing else that is more important than your relationship with Him. Hmm. And I see that. The almost committed. Matthew 6, says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Does, does it really matter how many of these things I have if I don't go to heaven? And I submit the answer is no. No. Maybe I find a way to be lesser happy with things and greater happy with a relationship with my God. You see, I'm convinced that almost is the devil's word. Almost makes me say I'm okay because after all, I'm better than them when I know that I'm not committed and I know that I'm not persuaded to allow my life to belong to God. And then I look further, moving from almost. First point, almost. Second point, almost thou persuadest me. Hmm. Almost persuaded. I got close, but I didn't get persuaded. Listen to John 20, 30 and 31. And many other miracles. Now look at all of them in the Bible. And many other miracles. Truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples. Which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe. And that believing you might have life through Jesus Christ his son. God wrote down the miracles to persuade you and me. What would it have taken to persuade me more than what God wrote? There were a bunch of others. Would I have been more impressed with some of the others? Why has God not given me sufficient to persuade me? 
Hmm. And I think he has given sufficient to persuade me. He put the book together and he says this is what should persuade you. He said that in Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when I hear the word of God, when I hear that word that's put together, I don't need any more. I need to reread the ones he put together. Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently search after him. Believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. I will get my reward. Mm. And see, sometimes we want to we want to sow wild oats and pray for a crop failure. <laughs> it ain't gonna happen. It isn't gonna happen. I'm going to sow to the spirit, or I'm gonna reap what the flesh reaps. Mm. And I think of that persuasion. I look at 2 Timothy 1.12. Paul said, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know in whom I have believed. Boy, I love that. I love that Paul knew whom he had believed. Now Paul was very strict with the what he believed. But he realized more importantly than the what was the whom. And he knew in whom he had believed it. He had a relationship with Jesus and the Father. And God is wanting us to have a relationship with him. Jesus is wanting a relationship with you. Paul said, for I know in whom I have believed it. And am persuaded, there's that word again, that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him. Watch that. Boy, that's key. That he is able to keep that which I've committed to him. There's not a thing on earth that you and I do without to allow Jesus to be the Lord of our lives that he doesn't know about. And he's keeping that which you've committed unto him against that day. You will not overcommit. You will not fail by committing. I don't need, I need to know that he's a rewarder of them that will diligently search after him. Just keep your search going. He will reward. He does not lie. And that's what Paul said. 2 Timothy 1.12. I want to go through it again. Paul said, For the which cause I also suffer these things. You mean, Paul, you're putting up with all that stuff? Why? <laughs> For I know in whom... I have believed it. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know in whom. Hmm. And I'm grateful to Paul for talking to me about that. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I've heard the word Christian explained and explained and explained and a bunch of them I don't think meet Hoyle when you go to the original language. A Christian is one that adheres to Jesus. Adheres. I think of Velcro. <laughs> we stick to him. We stick with him. We adhere to Jesus if we're Christians. Now, not just hearers, but those that adhere to Jesus. 
Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which art in heaven. Hmm. And then he goes on in 22, so interesting. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, see, they got the Lord, Lord part down pat. Have we not prophesied in thy name? That's preaching. And in thy name cast out devils? How'd they do that? I don't know. And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. If he never knew you, you didn't start properly. And then after a poor start, you didn't commit to the degree that you should have committed. I, I can't figure it any other way. But they're preaching, calling him Lord, Lord. And they're doing miracles, calling him Lord, Lord. And they're doing many wonderful works, calling him Lord, Lord. But calling is not the crux of the matter. Being is. Paul said in Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ, and for to me to die is gain. When to you to live is Christ, then you, to you to die is gain. But if to you to live in Christ, to you to die is a bad, bad thing. I've got to make it to me to live is Christ. I want to walk behind Jesus, because I don't want to see death unprepared to meet my Lord. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I think of John 14, 15. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I think of John 15, 14. He said, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. I think of 1 John 5, 3. I, I love that verse. He says, for herein, is, for herein is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Hmm. I'm sure you remember my illustration, but for the sake of somebody that hadn't heard it yet. National disaster. You see about a six or seven year old boy walking, carrying a boy about five. His feet are nearly dragging the ground and he's carrying him. First responder comes up and says, son, let me have that, that kid. He's too big for you. He said, no, I got him. The first responder, trying to be kind, said, no, son, let me carry him. He's too big. His feet are almost dragging the crown. The big boy said, he's not heavy. He's my brother. Mm. And I begin to understand burdensome from 1 John 5, 3. For herein is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdens. Wow. I think I get the verse, Lord. I appreciate it. How to become a Christian. I said, what is a Christian? Now I'm saying, how do I become a Christian? I don't, I don't think it's something we've never discussed. But for the sake of tying the whole lesson together, we'll say it again. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You can't become a Christian without believing in God. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. I've got to hear, and I've got to believe, and then I've got to repent. I tell you, Luke 13, 3 says, I tell you, nay, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Vance Havner wrote a book, and he called it Turn or Burn. Hmm. 
I don't know if the catchy language impresses me more than the way it was set forth in Luke 13, 3, but I get the message. And then I've got to be willing to confess him. Now, the best I can understand the word confess is that I've got to agree with him on everything he says. That's confession. Agreeing with him on everything he says. You know, that fixes a bunch of things. Because initially all I agreed with him on was how to be saved. But I had already made a commitment when I understood that, that as I studied and grew, that whatever I came to understand, I'd already made a commitment that I was going to agree with him on that too. Oh, it's not about me knowing everything before I become a Christian. No, no. It's about me making a decision that if he says it, I believe it, and that's the end of it. And when I learn what he says, that will be a part of me also. And then I see that I've got to be baptized into Jesus Christ. Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins and that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. But you know, that's just the start. That's the beginning. We finished the birth process, but that's all we finished. Now, a little baby's born. I mean, mom's wore out. But we hadn't gotten started yet. We just finished the birth process. You've got 20 or so years now. You've just begun. You've got the birth down pat, but now we've got to move on from there. And that's what he tells you and me to do. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was never intended that we're born to not grow. And if it were a physical child, We'd have him to the doctor. If he or she were born and didn't grow, well, we get all offended if somebody tries to take us to the doctor spiritually. Don't put people in that place. Get yourself to the doctor. Insist that you grow. Demand that you grow. Mm. What an interesting, interesting thought as we look at it. Because the purpose is, Revelation 2.10, to be faithful unto death to receive the crown of life. It's not just to be born. It's not just to grow for the sake of growing. It's with the intent of being faithful unto death that we get the crown of life. Oh, well i got a couple of three more points, but I've used my time. I look at and think that I want you to consider a third of the next point. Are there two ways to become a Christian? Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, because wide is the gate and broad is the way, which leads to them destruction. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth them to life, and few there be that find it. No. No, there's a narrow gate, a straight way. It does make a difference what you believe. It does make a difference how you believe. I look and think even further than that. And I, I would want that you knew that the word Christian, you'd think a word like that's all over your Bible. It's only three times in your Bible. Three times. We studied one of them. The first one's Acts 11, 26, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Huh. 1 Peter 4, 16 says, Yeah, and if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but glorify God on this behalf. Oh, Okay. And then Acts 26, 28. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You know what Paul said to that? When Agrippa said that, he said, I would to God that every man in my hearing 
were not almost persuaded, but was altogether persuaded, even as I am, except these bonds. Paul is in shackles preaching. And he said, I wish every one of you were exactly what I am, except for the shackles. I often think, can I say what Paul said? I wish every one of you were exactly what I am. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? If you can't say that, you need to get busy and fix what it is that you've got in mind that keeps you from saying that. I think that's a fair statement. I need to get busy and fix whatever it is I've got in mind as I say that. If you're not a Christian, we've spoken as plainly as we know how to speak. There's no doubt about it that Agrippa knew what Paul was talking about. Surely, we've been plain enough that everyone knows what we're talking about. If we can be of any assistance to anyone, if you please let us know, we want to assist as together we stand and sing. Uh -huh.